Hey everybody, Josh from Silka here with another episode of Marginal Gains TV. So today's episode uh, is one of my favorite topics, and that is hysteresis. Uh, I always get a little bit of a side look when we use that word uh, around non-engineers. Uh, I think every engineer is going to know uh, where this, uh, where we're going with this episode, because hysteresis is sort of the bane of uh, the engineer's existence. Um, typically, when you're trying to make something more efficient, make it better. Hysteresis is one of the things that's out there to really bite you. Um, you know, it can also uh, it, it be a good thing, right? Damping in uh, suspension is uh, a type of controlled uh, or controllable hysteresis. So, you know, there it's something that we, we actually can use to our advantage uh, from a control perspective. But from an efficiency perspective, it's pretty much never very good. Um, so to start off, hysteresis has nothing to do with hysterical or hysteria. Uh, those are some unfortunate words. If you really want to hear the full backstory, you can check it out on our podcast. Um, but that comes from Hippocrates really using uh, that word or developing that word uh, from a word called uh, hysterikos, uh, which means the womb to really sort of, uh, I would say, up until today, uh, connect uh, craziness with, uh, with women. And, you know, that I, I find to be pretty unfortunate. Uh, I think we use that word without really thinking or knowing the history and the backstory of it, but it actually has been used as a, really as a tool uh, to, to demean and to, to put people in their, their place uh, for a long time. And if you, you read the history of it, um, it's quite unfortunate. So I think if you're interested in that sort of social sociology, uh, you should should find that and read a little bit more about it because it's it's quite interesting on how uh, how one word can have so much power against uh, an entire group of people. Um, this word, though, hysteresis, uh, comes from a Greek word meaning uh, to be late or to be deficient. And it pops up in engineering where you have something that maybe behaves one way in one direction or with one speed in one direction and then behaves differently uh, on the return path. Um, we will go ahead and we can put up some graphics here uh, of what hysteresis looks like. Uh, I think this is an interesting one. This is hysteresis of a foam being impacted uh, in a running shoe. And the graph looks a little bit like a wing. Um, what I think is interesting here to think about is, you know, we talk about the Kipchoge two-hour marathon record. You know, us here at Silka, we've used the same foam from that two-hour marathon shoe to make a bar tape uh, that has incredibly low hysteresis. Um, and I think by the end of this episode, you'll see why you, you would want that. Um, but you think of you know, uh, something like a running shoe. When we push down on that foam, um, we can say push it at one speed. And then when we remove the load, it springs back, but it springs back at a slower speed. This is the late part of the, uh, the, the use of the word, or the deficient. It, it never springs back with giving as much energy uh, as was put into it. Um, the challenge with something like a running shoe, right, is that you want it to be soft so that it's cushioned and can absorb that impact, but then you also want it to have the minimum hysteresis for the maximum spring. Uh, so if we think of, uh, you know, something that I think all of us probably had as a kid, the Super Bowl, right, that you get the 25-cent vending machine that you begged your mom for, we've all been there, um, that's a super hard, uh, typically polyurethane material and it has incredibly low hysteresis. So when you throw that thing on the ground, it returns an incredibly high percentage of the energy that was put into it and will bounce very high. But of course, if you wanted to make a running shoe, you don't want to be landing on a Super Bowl because it's really hard and it has very minimal uh, give. And so, you know, the, the fine folks at Nike uh, worked with a company called Arkema to develop this foam that has uh, high cushion and high energy return. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to take that technology into some bar tape uh, to give you some of the similar, uh, similar feelings. 
But if we look at the foam, and like, let's say this is traditional EVA shoe foam in our graph right here. Um, and you can see that this top curve is your compression path, right? So we're coming out at one speed, and then the return is, as we're moving the load away, it's returning in a much different path, much more slowly, okay? So if we put up the, uh, the special, uh, it's called PBAX, uh, foam curve, you can see that the outbound and the rebound, uh, the compression and the rebound paths are much more similar. Um, they're still not the same, but they're much more similar. I think for a mind experiment, the, the one I always like to talk about when I'm doing, uh, like say the podcast or, or a talk, uh, where I don't have a beautiful floating screen, uh, is to think about the memory foam mattress commercials, right? So you have the memory foam mattress. They always seem to take the hand, they push it into the foam uh, on the mattress, and then they pull the hand away, and the handprint stays, and then slowly that handprint is going to come back. Um, that is a high hysteresis foam. Uh, and this is why you do not want to use materials like this um, in something like a bar tape. And unfortunately, a lot of companies are using memory foams uh, in shoes and bar tapes and things like that um, because it seems like it should be comfortable. But the reality is that it actually is not because it does not rebound quickly enough to take the next impact. Um, you know, you think of these are relatively static, low speed movements we're looking at. Uh, but the actual act of riding your bicycle. Uh, particularly at your hands, your butt, your feet, those are very high speed, high frequency uh, typically impacts. Um, and you need something that can respond with as low a hysteresis as possible uh, if you want maximum comfort and control. So that's sort of the general uh, high level hysteresis. Now where hysteresis really uh, probably bites us the most in cycling terms is in our tires, right? Because hysteresis is what is driving this thing we call rolling resistance. Um, we've talked about it before. I've got my magical Sharpie here that, you know, if we're taking our wheel and we are running over our Sharpie, um, you know, the wheel comes, it, it's the tires rolling on. Oh, maybe we should use a graphic for this. Okay, now we've got our graphic. So the tires rolling onto the bump uh, and you see the tire is compressed right over the bump and there's all of these little arrows these little force arrows pushing against they're impeding the direction of the tire rolling right so that's all energy that's being put into the tire and then as it rolls over the top a couple things happen so one the whole system is being lifted up and over that's an inefficiency and then as you roll down the other side you, you think the velocity you have is carrying the wheel kind of over the other end of the bump. So it's not, uh, it, it's not able to roll down the hill, so to speak, uh, with nearly as much efficiency as it hit the front side of the little bump um, because the motion's already in that direction. But as the tire's expanding back, it's expanding back more slowly than it was compressed. That's the hysteresis. And because it's expanding back more slowly, what energy it can return to the system uh, is reduced uh, fairly dramatically. And so this is where the hysteresis really starts to, um, you know, gets us in a big way, right? When we, we look at hitting the bump, as we are doing here. A um, lot of energy in, a little bit of energy comes back. Energy is lost ultimately to heat uh, in the casing of the tire, right? So you have casing of a tire is thousands or hundreds of thousands of little strands of like nylon or cotton, some fabric uh, typically together like this in what we call a bias ply, maybe two, three, four plies. Um, all that's held in some sort of a rubber matrix. Um, as those things move, there's friction, lots of little tiny friction points in there. Um, and th those are losses to heat. So this is where hysteresis gets us on a bump, but let's think of the hysteresis is also getting us when we're on a flat surface. Um, so let's pull our model back up again. There it is. So this is just flat surface uh, hysteresis. And if we think of this a little bit like dropping a ball, right? If I take a ball and I drop it, it's going to hit and it's going to go flat where it hits my table here. 
right? And it's going to be flattened at one velocity. And then it, as it returns its energy, again, it's returning its energy more slowly uh, than the energy went into it because of these losses to heat. Uh, so that's why if I drop a ball from this height, it will at best bounce up, you know, maybe 80% that high, right? Because you have all these losses uh, due to hysteresis in the bounce. Inefficient materials may only come back 20%. Uh, we've got a great video, we'll link it below, uh, to me dropping a butyl ball and a latex ball, uh, where you can see latex is somewhere on the 70% efficient and butyl is maybe in the 25% efficient. Uh, the latex is returning on the order of three times more energy to the system, uh, which is why latex inner tubes and latex in tires is much more efficient than butyl. Uh, but back to our flat rolling uh, tire here in hysteresis. What happens is, as the tire is, is rolling forward, the front half of the contact patch is being compressed. So you've got this uncompressed tire is coming down onto our flat surface and then being flattened. And it's gradually getting flatter until it hits the middle of the contact patch, um, where it's at its widest. And then it's pushing, pushing out as the wheel rolls forward, it's giving some of that energy back, but again, it's not giving it back with 100% efficiency. And so if we graph the energy in, you go in our graph, and now out, you see that there's more put in than comes out. Um, that's due to the hysteresis. This is what rolling resistance is. Um, this is also what leads us to really our traditional thinking that high tire pressure is gonna be faster because higher tire or higher tire pressure leads to less tire deformation and so you can see where less deformation in this model will have less hysteresis if your contact patch is smaller if your tire is being compressed less uh, there's less energy being put in then there's less energy to come back out it's a little bit like the super ball situation right if we make it really hard it will compress less and rebound uh, more quickly and that really largely is true. You know, when we go indoor track uh, cycling, those pressures go way, way up, and the efficiency comes and comes and comes uh, indoors on super smooth, flat surfaces, typically until we get to the limitations of the tire glue, which is a, uh, is a different story that we'll cover um, in a second here. But we talked in our asymmetry episode about how it's not just hysteretic loss in the tire, right? So we go back to our bump, uh, there it is. We go back to our bump and we look at the losses in the bump and we see that we have this other type of loss which is the force due to the hitting the bump, the force due to lifting the bicycle up, and then actually the dropping of it back down really doesn't put much energy back in the system. That's the impedance that we talk about, uh, which is highly, highly inefficient. Uh, and if you're comparing most really high-end bicycle tires to impedance losses, the bike tire is going to be way more efficient uh, than the impedance. So, uh, kind of summing all of that up, losses due to casing deformation, those are hysteresis-based losses, right? Just like dropping the ball on the table. We have those same losses, if you think about them, um, they're in your handlebar tape, right? Your contact points, you've got... The, the hands kind of pounding against the bars, the, uh, the more rigid that interface is, the more impedance losses you have, the higher damping, the higher hysteresis you have in your foam, you actually have losses in the tape itself. The same thing happens in saddles. Uh, and think about if you use insoles, the same thing happens in shoes. So I know uh, of a number of people over the years who've been fitted for uh, insole orthotic things, uh, you know, oftentimes maybe from uh, something that was designed for a running shoe or somebody who built the orthotic that uh, didn't realize it was for a cycling shoe, maybe something more general purpose, and you put like a neoprene foam covering on that insole, you are now introducing uh, hysteretic loss uh, in every single pedal stroke. So you really ultimately want that interface to be as rigid as possible uh, for maximum power transfer down there. Um, yeah, so 
We've gotten through that. Contact points, super important. What's your tire to the road? That's a contact point. Anywhere there's a contact point, uh, there is a, a big opportunity for hysteresis. Um, even if it's purely rigid contact, uh, you know, don't, don't go take your bar tape off thinking that uh, your hands on an untaped rigid bar are going to be uh, super efficient because now you still have losses due to friction um, there and you know maybe that loss of control maybe the hands are slipping they're moving slightly uh, you're gonna get blisters if you're getting get, if you are getting blisters uh, that comes from uh, high frequency vibration which means that you are experiencing hysteresis losses in that interface uh, so again that's an it's a great opportunity for us to try to optimize um, you know, both the materials that we're using, the setup, the positioning, all of these things, uh, you know, as we go out and we try to set these, these personal bests uh, in our events. So, uh, we said we'd get back to our original graph of hysteresis, this one. Uh, now, this is pretty cool. This is the graph of the hysteresis of foam being impacted and uh, essentially loaded and unloaded, right? Compressed, rebound. Now look at this graph. This one's pretty cool too. This looks awfully similar, doesn't it? This is the graph of the hysteresis of an aircraft wing stalling. Now, you know, I think this is the type of stall uh, that we think of from the old World War II, uh, you know, dogfighting movies, right? Where the, the plane goes into a bank that's so steep that it begins to stall. So it's not an engine stall, which is a loss of power, but actually you have detached the airflow from the top of the wing. Okay, so as the, the wing starts to pitch up and up and up, the flow begins to slowly detach at the back and work its way forward to a point that the lift goes off the top of the wing, the drag goes up, and now the wing is not so much a wing at all. Um, and what do they do in the movies to regain control of the plane, they use the same maneuver every time. They push the plane down into a dive to try to reattach the airflow, and then they can level it out. This is an incredibly high hysteresis event, and I think is, is pretty interesting. If you pitch the wing slowly as we ride up this curve, you see the flow detaches really slowly, almost the whole way, and then suddenly right at the end. But look what happens if you pitch the wing down, the flow doesn't begin to reattach, right? In fact, if you go horizontal, the flow doesn't reattach. You have to go into that dive to get the, the speed back, uh, to get the air velocity back, and the st stable flow on that wing to reattach that flow. That, to, to me, is a fascinating uh, example of hysteresis in aircraft. This is exactly what is happening uh, on your bicycle wheels and your frame with crosswinds. And one of the big factors that affect crosswind stability uh, in the modern bicycle. That flow may be attached and at some wind angle, car passes, uh, winds change, the flow can detach, right? Dramatically changing the forces and the drag. And then at some point uh, you have to reattach it or ideally you want to reattach it. Um, but it doesn't reattach nearly as easily uh, or as quickly as it detaches. So, again, this is the hysteresis of that. If we look at the hysteresis of a bicycle wheel uh, in yaw, in the wind tunnel, it looks something like this. Now, this is drag to yaw, but you can see here, it, it's really pretty much the same curve. Um, you know, here the drag comes down and down and down. It goes actually quite low, and then it comes back on a much higher curve. I mean, this is basically the, the wing curve, right? And so here's where this gets kind of crazy. So as I'm preparing this video and looking at these graphs, these are, you know, NACA classic uh, aircraft wing graphs for, you know, inviscid flow over uh, different wing forms, right? This stuff's all over the Internet. Uh, I'm sitting in bed and my wife next to me says, why are you looking at transpulmonary pressure compliance graphs? I don't even know what that is, I said to her. 
Um, sounds like lung related, and it is. Lung compliance, this is the, uh, the inspiration, uh, expiration um, pressures of your lung as you breathe in and you exhale. Uh, so we look it up, and uh, these transpulmonary pressure compliance graphs look like this. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty much the same graph. Uh, I think what's interesting, maybe most interesting here, these are all factors uh, that are airflow related. Uh, there's a ton of, uh, of graphs similar out there that are not airflow related. Um, they look, yeah, well, the, the foam graphs look pretty much the same. Uh, they all look the same because they are hysteresis driven effects, right? So th this is the important thing to think about. This hysteresis isn't just rolling resistance. It isn't just cycling. It isn't just running shoes. Uh, it isn't just lungs. Uh, it's kind of with us everywhere affecting a ton of things and wherever you have it uh, you have that We didn't get into it But one of the ways that the engineers would look at this like on the foam uh, graph and I, I Assume it's probably the same with the lungs. I didn't ask um, If you integrate the area between the two curves that in there is the energy loss Right, so the the less area between those curves, the less energy loss. The more energy between the curves, the more energy loss. Um, so visually, it gives us a good way to think about, uh, you know, the, the losses here uh, as as we study whatever it is we choose to study. Right, be it rolling resistance or, or uh, lung compliance. So uh, we will be using this word throughout, uh, really, uh, I'd say probably all of our episodes and certainly in our Q&A because hysteresis comes back to haunt us uh, over and over again as we are searching for efficiencies in pretty much any system we're ever going to look at optimizing. Uh, so there you have it. Hysteresis, uh, not our friend, uh, not in this sense. Um, we're going to try to minimize it, and as we get into some of our future episodes where we talk about special minimizations, optimizations, uh, how to go faster, how to do more, we're going to be using this word quite a lot. Uh, anyway, thanks for bearing with me on this one. Uh, I hope you found it as interesting as I do, and I look forward to seeing you next time.